everybody. I'm Maria Delera, and today I will be answering your questions regarding the management of systemic lupus erythematosus. Our first question is, are there any biologic and DMARD combinations that you avoid in patients with SLE, or are they all relatively safe and effective? This question has to do with what combinations of therapies we can use in our patients with SLE. And as we all know, the field is moving now towards combination therapy. We have that specifically in the guideline for lupus nephritis, our updated ACR 2024 guideline. But we also are using combinations of therapies in extra renal lupus. And the way that I would like to answer this question is to bring us back to what the evidence and the data show us. I like to use combinations of therapies that have been shown to have efficacy and safety in our clinical trials. For example, in, for the setting of extra renal SLE, patients who are coming in with cutaneous disease, arthritis, Cirrusitis, we have very good data for the combinations of the biologics of either belimumab or anaphrolumab, which are our two FDA approved therapies for extra renal lupus. Those can be used in combination with a variety of conventional background immunosuppressives, including methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate. And of course, our background therapy is always going to be hydroxychloroquine. In terms of lupus nephritis, we have other combinations that we use. We use belimumab in combination with low-dose cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. That would be a combination with biologic and, and conventional. So as you see, we have a, we have a variety of choices here, uh, but based upon what the literature has taught us. The second question, is there a role for baclosporin alone or in combination with other therapies in non-renal lupus? And I love this question. This gets to the question about the therapy of baclosporin, which as we know, was FDA approved for the treatment of active lupus nephritis in combination with background therapy and the way that it was used in the lupus nephritis pivotal trial, which was called Aurora 1, baclosporin was used in combination with a lower dose of mycophenolate, a dose of two grams of mycophenolate, and of course on background um, hydroxychloroquine. We don't have data to support the use of baclosporin once we get outside the kidney, we don't have those data. We have data for other therapies to use for extra renal lupus. And thus, I reserve, reserve the use of baclosporin in the setting of lupus nephritis, again, as the evidence has shown us. And just to remind everybody, baclosporin is FDA approved for the treatment of active lupus nephritis in combination with background therapy, which typically is going to be mycophenolate. This question is how would you approach switching from belimumab to anaphrolumab? And this is an interesting question as well, thinking about how we sequence our therapies. And this is a common situation that we are in. I take care of a lot of lupus patients, just like all of you. And we're often in situations where we have to transition off of one medication and start our patients on a next medication. In this situation, I would just stop belimumab and then go ahead and start anaphrolumab. In my experience, there is not a need for a washout of any sort with these particular therapies. Belimumab is a very safe therapy. It can just be stopped and then start, start anaphrolumab. Again, no data to support having to wait a period of time. These molecules target different pathways and they're complementary. And thus you can just stop one and start the other one. How do you manage belimumab related neuropsychiatric symptoms such as depression or hallucinations? This is a very interesting question. This has to do with some of the adverse effects that have been reported 
in association with valimumab. And before I answer this question, I think it's important just to set the stage and take a step back. It's very interesting in the phase two and the pivotal phase three trials of belimumab in extra renal lupus, there were reports of numerically more psychiatric related adverse events, including depression, suicidality in patients receiving belimumab versus control on background standard of therapy. Since that time, there have been other studies performed delving into this question. There was a post hoc analysis that was performed of the phase two and the phase three trials. And then there was a large randomized placebo controlled trial of approximately 4,000 participants that, in which participants were randomized to belimumab versus placebo on top of background therapy. It's a phase four trial called the BASE trial, B-A-S-E, specifically to look at adverse events. And interestingly, there were very few events of psychiatric related issues, depression, suicidal ideation in that 4,000 patient trial. And in fact, there was a slight a numerical difference in terms of numbers, in terms of more psychiatric related events like depression, for example, in the belimumab group, but the numbers were exceedingly small, less than 1% of the participants in the trial had these effects and there were no suicides. So therefore, I view this as an extraordinarily rare adverse event. In my practice, I have yet to see this adverse event, just to put that in perspective. However, it has been reported in these studies, as I mentioned. If you have a patient who you think is having a psychiatric event and you think it is related to belimumab, you have to stop the belimumab. That's the only thing you can do. However, it's important to remember that there are a variety of other reasons why a patient with lupus might have underlying psychiatric manifestations. Number one, you always have to make sure that you're not dealing with a manifestation of central nervous system lupus, because we know, for example, that hallucination psychosis can be a manifestation of CNS lupus. You don't want to miss that and attribute that to a medication when in fact it's due to lupus. And there are other issues as well. We know that glucocorticoids can cause these sorts of psychiatric adverse events. So I think the teaching point here for all of us is just to remain humble and open-minded that when our patients come to us with psychiatric manifestations, we need to do a deep dive and try to understand what is the underlying etiology of those manifestations, do the workup, and at the end of the day, if you do think that belimumab is the culprit, you need to just stop the belimumab. Next question is for extra renal disease with significant joint and skin activity, which biologic provides the best steroid sparing effect in practice? This question has to do with the important issue of how do we choose our targeted therapies for extra renal manifestations. Our question here deals with joint and skin, so we're extra renal. And as we all remember, we have two FDA approved therapies for the treatment of extra renal lupus. We have belimumab, which targets BAF, B cell activating factor, and we have anaphrolumab, which targets the subunit one of the type one interferon receptor. And they both have been demonstrated to be effective for both lupus musculoskeletal manifestations, specifically inflammatory arthritis, and also cutaneous manifestations of lupus. They both are effective. They're different in their onset of action. Belimumab, because of its mechanism of action, will take a bit longer to have an effect in, in the joints and the skin. We typically think three months, four months. So we have to keep our patients on this medication before we can uh, see the maximal effect. And afrolumab in the skin tends to work more quickly. And the data from the clinical trials have shown 
an earlier response in terms of resolution of, of cutaneous lesions with anaphrolumab. But for the joints, anaphrolumab also takes a little bit more time to have the effect. But at the end of the day, these are both good therapies for these manifestations. And I think it comes down to shared decision-making and thinking about side effect profile, for example, uh, mode of action, so a mode of delivery. So right now, um, anaphrolimab is FDA approved in its intravenous form. Belimumab, we have a subcutaneous and an intravenous form. That might make a difference. There are a variety of other factors, but you can use both. And that's what's so wonderful right now. We have therapies that we can use in our patients that we believe will be disease modifying in them and will enable us to improve their health outcomes.